Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. In this video, um, I need to cover something that I forgot to cover uh, in this whole study I've been doing into the Antichrist, and that is the horn, the small horn. The horn that is not Betty Horn, one of my subscribers, right? <laughs> We've talked about that in the past. She's not the Antichrist, thank goodness. So, if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video. If you end up liking it, hit the notification bell. Uh, make sure to share this. Again, uh, I think there's a lot of people confused about this concept, and this will probably benefit somebody if you share it. Uh, and then make sure to leave your comments. So, um, yeah, I totally forgot about the whole uh, small horn until I read this comment here by Finally the Truth. Um, Finally the Truth says, uh, Is the Pope the false prophet, or is he a good guy and a great teacher, as Elder Holland says? Uh, <laughs> I, yeah. I'll tell you the truth. I'm not a big fan. Um, I don't. I haven't seen that quote from Elder Holland, but I'm sure he was just being polite. He's not going to be like, you know, the Pope's the Antichrist or anything like that. Um, anyway, uh, and then uh, this person continues, focus on the book of Revelation and the dragon, the beast, and the small horn. Uh, I think the Pope is the head of Satan's forces on the earth. Um it's a it's a possibility. Uh, I'm not gonna like go too strong with that on my channel because I'm not trying to offend um, Catholics or make them think that we hate them. But um, the Pope as an individual and kind of as a as an institution through time, yeah, yeah maybe. Um, it seems like Bruce R. McConkie at least at one point uh, felt that way, and I think that he he did. Um, anyway, the temple that Satan sits in, proclaiming to be God, is the Earth, not the Third Temple. Yeah, I, I tend, it's kind of like this next comment here, what she's about to say. Um, I, I think you're pretty much right. Um, Satan wants Christians to think the two witnesses are the Antichrist. Uh, I, I don't know where you're getting that from. I mean, that could be. I just, I, I would need some further explanation. But anyway, um, and then Pamela Love, uh, Pamela Loves Jesus Christ says, we are the temple of God. Yeah, that's that's true. We we are our bodies are temples. We are temples. Um, who is sitting in your temple? It's spiritual, not physical. Wake up. Um, I agree. Um, now and then, uh, I wanted to read this one too before we get into this because I'm gonna be I'm gonna be going through um, Daniel seven, eight, and then Revelation thirteen, and then the uh, corresponding um, manuals that go along with that. Uh, so, but before I do. Um, this person, uh, Stuart Boyer, in response to the video that I did uh, yesterday. Oh, by the way, happy uh, Christmas Eve. I hope everyone's getting ready for a good Christmas and everyone's in the spirit. Okay, so he is responding to my my video, Why Do the Scriptures Say the Antichrist Will Sit in the Temple of God? Um, okay, he says, Following this sound reasoning uh, would lead us to look at approximately... 24 and a half years from the birth of Jesus Christ for some major event. Uh, additionally, 49 years from his birth would contain some other significant event, correct? I'm not a big fan of Wikipedia, but there are references on the information. Yeah, I, you guys, Wikipedia is fine. It, it shouldn't be like your ultimate source of information, but there is, it is useful and there is correct information on there. It's just, you want to make sure you, you're thorough and Make sure you can validate whatever it is with multiple sources, um, you know, authoritative sources. So here goes. Between 24 and 29 AD is the estimated date of the first cleansing of the temple of, by Christ, and 49 AD is the estimated time of the expulsion of the Jews from Rome. Daniel 9.27 uh, and he, Jesus Christ, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he, Jesus Christ, uh, shall cause the sacrifice and ablation to cease. And I would argue, allow, um, you know, I guess like, you know, allow because of, of rebellion. Like he took his church off the earth because um, the wicked rebelled against it. Uh, and killed the the apostles. So kind of both is what I would say. Um, okay, by cleansing the temple uh, in 20, 24 and a half AD. Okay, so he caused the sacrifice and oblation to be to cease by cleansing the temple uh, in 24 and a half AD. And for the overspreading of abominations, uh, he shall make it desolate, even until the consumption. And that 
determined shall be poured upon the desolate. No time frame, but probably 49 to 70 AD, uh, being the expulsion of Jews from Rome, uh, following the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple destruction prophecy fulfillment. Yeah, I think that's pretty. I think that's pretty good. Yeah, that, that's a good comment. Um, yeah, I think I, I, you know, I'm really starting to think that that 70th week of Daniel. I really do think that it's this time frame right here. It makes the most sense, even though there's footnotes that. Um, have to do with the last days. I, I don't know that they're necessarily saying that it that the 70th week of Daniel is going to happen in the last days so much as it corresponds and is related to um, the last days. Because the book of Daniel is all about, uh, it, it's essentially, if you were like to pick one main theme, it's basically about the last days, but also the kingdoms of the earth from the time of Daniel, starting with the Babylonian Empire, until the second coming that that's kind of like the overall theme of the book of daniel so um anyway let, so let's get into it okay so in daniel chapter 7 let's read the the heading daniel sees four beasts representing the kingdoms of men he sees the ancient of days adam uh to whom the son of man christ will come the kingdom will be given to the saints forever and we know that christ assumes um, the reign over the earth at Adam on Diamond, right? So this is like a, an Adam on Diamond uh, chapter, essentially. So it, 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 okay, so in the first year of Belshazzar, so this is after Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed, and he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. And it talks about four great beasts uh, coming up out of the sea, diverse from one another. First was like a lion, uh, second like a bear, um, and so on. Okay. Now, okay. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. And it had uh, great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. So a really powerful beast, the, the, the fourth, um, very strong, uh, different from the ones before it, and it has ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Okay, so here's where we start talking about um, the Antichrist, uh, according to certain interpretations. They believe that this little horn, <clears throat> excuse me, this little horn is the Antichrist. Um, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Um, I beheld, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was like was white as snow, and the hair of his head uh, like the pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. So this talking about, again, talking about Adam, and it, seemingly about Adam, Adam on Ayaman, the, the event that initiates the downfall of the earthly kingdoms, where Christ... Um, comes in and, and takes the takes the earth like begins to take the earth um okay so let me just look here what's it say for this footnote for horn it takes you to this next chapter that we're going to read um and out of one of them came forth a little horn okay so it's just making reference to that we're going to go over that in just a second okay and then continuing on to verse 11 i beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his his body destroyed, and given to the burning flame. Okay, and concerning the rest of the beast, they were that had their dominion taken away by Christ, uh, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. And uh, I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to Adam, uh, or came to Ancient of Days, uh, Adam on Diamond. And they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom and a kingdom that all the people, 
nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Okay, so we're talking about a fourth beast, has ten horns, uh, three of the horns go away, and then there's a little horn, um, then this little horn has eyes and a mouth speaking great things, and so on and so forth. Okay, now let's go down here to 20. Uh, it's talking about the, the ten horns again. And of the ten horns, there were in his head, and of the other which came up, um, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth to speak, or that spake, so we're talking about the little horn again, very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. So the look of the little horn was more stout than his fellows. Uh, I beheld in the same horde, horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Okay, so let's, let's keep that in mind. So this little horn... Um, came up, it had eyes and mouth, it was more stout than its fellows, it made war with the saints and prevailed against them. So I can understand why, you know, if you don't have modern revelation, if you if you don't have um, the interpretations of these things, which, which okay, I'm going to get into that, but you would think, oh, okay, this sounds like an Antichrist. This must be the Antichrist. Um, well, let's continue. And the ten horns out of the kingdom are ten kings. So now we're talking about the interpretation. Well, let's just let's just read these two. Um, Until the Ancient of Days came, Adam, and the judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom um, for the millennium, right? He said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another, now talking about the small horn, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. So this is sounding, you know, pretty specific, right? So it really does make it seem like this is like a big bad guy, a big antichrist. And he shall speak, speak great words um, against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given unto his hand until a time in times and the dividing of time. So here's, here's a mention of basically what some would say would be three and a half years. Time and times and the dividing of a time. Uh, I'm going to do another video about all the instances where we're talking about three and a half years, because... Um, th that seems to be the basis of the idea of a seven-year tribulation period, which um, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily buy into, um, and I'll explain why in that video. Um, but anyway, here here's one mention of it. Um, but the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it to the end. Okay, so it's going to end. Now let's go over to the student manual. Okay. Uh, this is um, the Old Testament student manual, Daniel, prophet of, prophet of God, companion of kings. Um, let's read what this says about what we just read. Okay. So it, it, up here, it's talking about basically, um, you know, how these kings kind of, they, they actually kind of, or these uh, beasts, the, the four beasts, they kind of correspond with Nebuchadnezzar's dream about the Babylonian Empire, and then after that you have the Median Persian Empire, that's the, like, the um, arms, the two arms, and the, the chest and stuff. Um, and then after that, uh, the Greek Empire with Alexander the Great, <clears throat> right? Um, or the Macedonian Empire, uh, it's also known as. Okay, now, <clears throat> check this out. The fourth beast was not like to an animal. Uh, in this, in that vision, right? It was, however, very strong and dreadful, and broke into pieces the the remains of the former kingdoms. It represented the Roman Empire and the forces of evil that were manifest through the empire. The ten horns are the kingdoms into which the Roman Empire uh, was afterwards divided. They are similar to the ten toes of the great image described in Daniel two. Or in other words, the uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the, the statue. Okay, so we're talking about the Roman Empire. Um, 
though each of these beasts may uh, be said to represent the worldly kingdoms mentioned, the representation probably was not just of their political dominion, but also of the evils upheld and, per and perpetrated upon the world by their rule. Uh, the vision should not be thought of as wholly political either, uh, particularly in view of the little horn. Okay, so it's not just talking about kingdoms and dominions, it's spiritual as well. Okay, so the little horn. This symbol cannot be positively identified with any specific individual or kingdom of the world, but seems to be similar to the beast rising out of the sea that John saw in Revelation uh, chapter 13, uh, which we're going to go over that too, uh, as did the form, or as did this form. Uh, the little horn represented a notable antichrist, and notice that in the manual here, it's not saying a singular, final, main antichrist, because <clears throat> in my previous videos about antichrist, we know that uh, there are multiple antichrists. It's anyone that's like basically actively uh, preaching against the doctrine of Christ and against Christ, right? So the little horn represented a notable antichrist who had raised up after the time of the Roman Empire. And it was to be different from the other ten kingdoms mentioned after the, Ro the Roman Kingdom. Daniel said that this horn uh, would have the power to make war with and hinder the saints until the time of Christ's second coming. Concerning this great evil power and the beast from which it arose, Sidney B. Sperry said, quote, May I suggest that the last beast that Daniel saw, which was so terrible, uh, and which had a mouth speaking great things, <clears throat> is none other than the great and abominable church. All right, let's stop and let's stop and think about that. Okay, and it makes sense because if you have the Roman Empire, it, okay, so we're going to go with Bruce R. McConkie's first interpretation of the um, great and abominable church. So if you have the Roman Empire and then you have these kingdoms that come afterward, well, we know that um, a certain church uh, basically started uh, in the Roman Empire, right? Constantine made Christianity the, the official religion. He adopted it, um, implemented it. And um, we know that, you know, I, again, I don't want to like go against Catholics because I think there's a lot of really good God-fearing Catholics that are genuine. Um, but the fact of the matter, this is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And um, it, it would make sense, especially thinking about what Bruce R. McConkie said that, um, you know, the great and abominable church probably is uh now the official interpretation of it is that it's um any church any philosophy that goes against um the true church right any church that, that's not the true church but um i think that we have to take into account what bruce Armand conkey said and it makes a lot of sense when you read daniel here because this little horn um which could be you know essentially the roman the roman Catholic Church, um, which still has great, great, great power in the world today. Yeah, maybe maybe that's what we're talking about here. Okay, so uh, this is what Sidney B. Sperry is saying. Um, who, who is Sidney B. Sperry? Does anybody know? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look him up really quick. Sidney B. Sperry, or Sperry was one of three scholars who were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, who began scholarly and systematic study of the Book of Mormon. So it looks like it was a it, an LDS scholar. Okay, cool. Okay, let me make my point clear. Keep in mind that Daniel saw the beast was slain and its body destroyed. And uh, it was given to be burned with fire. In a revelation to the prophet Joseph Smith concerning the destructive forces to be unleashed prior to the second coming, the Lord explains, uh, The evil power is doubtless the same one spoken of in the, 20, in the 29th section of the Doctrine and Covenants and testified to by Ezekiel the prophet. The Book of Mormon also speaks at length, length concerning this evil force in the world, uh, that will meet destruction. Notice a few of the words of Nephi. Let, let's read these scriptures. Um, 
Okay, so Doctrine and Covenants 29 and 21. So, this evil power is doubtless the same one spoken of in the 29th section of the, of the Doctrine and Covenants, and then also in Ezekiel. So, Doctrine and Covenants says, And the great and abominable church, which is the whore of all the earth, shall be cast down by devouring fire, according as it is spoken of, or is spoken by the mouth of Ezekiel the prophet, who spoke of these things which have not come to pass, but surely must, as I live, for abominations shall not reign. Okay, what does Ezekiel say? Ezekiel 38, 14 through 23. Um, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, right? Talking about Gog and Magog. Uh, Thus saith the Lord, in that day when my people of Israel dwell safely, safely, shall thou not know it? And thou shalt come for, from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all them riding upon horses, a great company, and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. So it sounds like this great and abominable church coming up against the saints. Um, it shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, uh, that the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by the servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come upon shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in the day there shall be great shaking in the land of Israel. And the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all men, all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. Um, and I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother, and I will plead against him with pestilence and w with blood. I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him in overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Okay. Um, I'm not going to read this one from Nephi, really, because it's going to be talking about the, the great and abominable church. See, in the blood of the great and abominable church, uh, which is the whore of all the earth, shall turn upon their own heads, and so on. Okay, so yeah, that, that makes sense to me. And um, I guess they were confident enough to put it in the Old Testament student manual that they would be teaching to thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, youth, right? Um, okay. May I emphasize that even if the Great and Abominable Church is correctly identified as the power which is uh, represented by Daniel's Great Beast, we do not at present fully comprehend the ramifications of it or the range of dominion it will have prior to its destruction. Okay, yeah, so now let's go over to uh, chapter 8. Uh, this one says, Daniel sees in vision a ram, which represents uh, Media and Persia, which is the second part of the statue. The first being the Babylonian Empire, which has a gold head, and then after that, Media and Persia. And then after that, um, a goat, which represents Greece, which is the next part of the statue. Um four other kings, and then, in the last days, a fierce king who will destroy the holy people. This king will be broken when he stands up against the prince of princes. Of princes. Okay. So, yeah, it that totally sounds the, like the great and abominable church. Yeah, I, I think that's what, I, I'm pretty sure that's what the little horn is. Okay, up here. And out of one of them, uh, well, this is talking about after, okay, therefore he, the he-goat, or the Greek empire, uh, waxed very great, um, 
well, the Alexander's, you know, Macedonia. Um, therefore, the he goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones uh, toward the four winds of heaven. Keep that in mind because we're going to read about that uh, in the manual. Um, and out of one of them, so out of one of the, the four notable ones, out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceedingly great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them and he magnified himself even to the prince of the host and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down and in host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression and it cast down the truth of the ground and it pra uh, practiced and prospered wow this is sounding a lot like uh daniel 9 talking about the the sacrifice uh, being taken away the uh, we read about the I think it, uh, it's worded as the sacrifice and the oblation to be taken away um, talking about stars uh, being cast down to the ground that sounds like Revelation 12 um, okay let's continue on down here now we're in verse 23 and in the latter time of their kingdom, when the, transgressor, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but uh, not by his own power. Uh, and he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. So it's like talking about that, that horn again. Um, and though his policy, and through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many, and he shall also stand up against the prince of princes, of princes, uh, but he shall broken without hand. So that that again, that sounds a lot like the stone coming out of the mountain. Uh, because this is still talking about, you know, the kingdoms of the world. Um, so we know that the, the great statue, the the world powers, they're going to be destroyed by the stone that came out of the mountain uh, that was uh, created without, you know, hands uh, representing God, right? Um, so after all this, uh, Daniel fainted and then he became sick. <laughs> so... Uh, it was really troubling to him. Um, okay, so let's read what the student manual says about what we just read in, in Daniel chapter 8. So first we went over Daniel 7, and then we read Daniel chapter 8, and now here is what it says. Okay. Um, again, it's talking about... Okay, so the, the title of this section, What was the significance of, of Daniel's vision of the ram and the he-goat? So it's talking again, it's talking about um, Alexander the Great, the Greek Empire. Um, okay, the little horn that came from one of them was just, okay, well, I should read this first. Uh, so at the age of 32, gosh, 32, what, what am I doing with my life? I don't have an empire. <laughs> uh, Alexander died in the height of his power. Uh, when he was strong, the great horn was broken. After he died, his four general, his four chief generals carved up the empire, and they seem to be the four notable horns that came up instead of the one. Okay, so this um, the third part of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar, the Greek Empire under Alexander. He died, and then it was divided up into four pieces and that seems to correspond with the four horns that we read about in Daniel 8. Okay, the little horn that came from one of them has generally been interpreted to represent Antiochus the fourth, Epiphanes, who ruled Syria uh, from 175 to 164 BC. He persecuted the Jews bitterly, declaring 
okay, so I just want to highlight that. So this is uh, before Christ. Um, he persecuted the Jews uh, bitterly, declaring observance of the Mosaic Law to be a capital offense. George Reynolds and Jan M. Sodal uh, wrote, quote, that this little horn represents Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, is a view entertained by most ancient writers, but this does not exclude the probability that the great and abominable power previously referred to, and which is the church of the devil, uh, is pointed is pointed to by the prophet as necessary to complete fulfillment of his prediction. Uh, what Antiochus was to the Jews during the time of the Maccabees, uh, the church of the devil has been to the church of Christ in all ages. Okay, so you get that? So, okay, so yeah, so the Maccabees, you remember, that's that's the time when Hanukkah, you had like the first Hanukkah, you had the Greeks that were, um, you know, try, trying to basically uh, just give the Jews problems, okay? Um, so what Antiochus was to them at that time, the church of the devil, the great and abominable church, will be to the church of Christ in our time, Okay. Uh, though Antiochus IV, uh, the fourth may fit the conditions described in the prophecy, he seems to have been a type of those who function through the power of Satan and seek to cast down the stars of heaven. Um, so, okay, and seek to magnify themselves against the prince of princes, uh, who is Christ. Antiochus IV took away the daily sacrifice of the temple and cast down the place of the Lord's sanctuary. Similar events occurred during the Roman era after the coming of Christ. Elder Parley P. Pratt said, quote, Now, in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgression of the Jewish nation was come to the full, the Roman power destroyed the, Jew the Jewish nation, took Jerusalem, caused the daily sacrifice to cease, and not only that, but afterwards destroyed the mighty and holy people, that is, the apostles and the, prim and the primitive Christians who were slain by the authorities of Rome. Okay. Interesting. It's interesting because, you know, in, in Revelation 12, again, that, that's the whole thing about the church giving birth to the kingdom of God and the dragon being ready to swallow it up. And right here, we're, we're reading about Rome. And again, like we were talking about before, you know, what church... Uh, you know, was basically started by the Roman Empire. What, what Christian church? Um, yeah, it's the, the Roman Catholic Church. Um, that this prophecy refers to more than just the t more than just the time up through the Maccabean period is also indicated by two phrases. Uh, the phrase "in the last end of indignation" means in the latter period of indignation or in the last days. Uh, the phrase in verse twenty six. Uh, it shall be for many days, uh, means pertains to many days hereafter. Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I don't, t I, it, it really does seem to be that this is referring to, uh, the little horn is referring to the, the great and abominable church. Um, but like it says, we don't have the, the full meaning of it. So, I mean, can you speculate that there's going to be a singular person? I, I, yeah, I guess so, <laughs> if you want to do that. But is, is that the sense that you get when you read through this and, and when you put it all together? Doesn't it make sense when we talk about the Roman Empire and the church that came out of the Roman Empire and what it did to the original saints and the power that it's had for these 2,000 years and it still has great power and, um, you know, and, and especially right now, you know, I've done that video about uh, the current Pope, Pope Francis. He's doing some very, very odd things on the world stage, not just within uh, the Catholic Church, but like he's trying to do stuff with other churches. So you'll have to check out that video. Um, I'll put that down below in the description. So let's just end this with um, now we got to go to Revelation 13. Which, keep in mind, this comes right after Revelation 12, which has to do, like we were just talking about, it has to do with the great apostasy, it has to do with uh, the, the dragon, 
uh, ready to destroy the kingdom of God. And, and the woman who took the child into the wilderness, representing the great apostasy, how God take, he took the earth and the kingdom off the earth. And basically the, the dragon had power all the way up until the restoration. Okay, so, so we're in the chapter right after that. Now we're in chapter 13. John sees fierce looking beasts that represent degenerate earthly kingdoms controlled by Satan. Uh, the devil works miracles and deceives men. Okay, so check this out. Um, let's just start with verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast arise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns uh, ten crowns, and upon his head his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, Satan. And the dragon, Satan, gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Uh, again, I, I would I would suggest think about uh, think about the Catholic Church. Um, and when when I say that, you guys, um, just know, I mean, the Vatican. Okay, so ever ever since like the beginning of it, it's been a seat of power, right? If you've taken European history, history, you know that um, Rome, the Vatican, has had a, a real strong hand in European history and world history, like real consequential power in things that took place. And um, if we think about again, if we think about. Uh, you know, modern day Gadiant robbers and secret combinations like it, it's it's involved with that stuff. There's a lot of uh, really bad things going on uh, there. Wh wherever there's power, wherever there's high concentrations of power, you're going to have secret combinations or you're going to have secret combinations that are trying to uh, obtain that power for themselves. OK, so it's not just the Catholic Church. It's what it's what the power of the Vatican is able to do throughout the world. Okay. And with politics and so forth. Okay. So, uh, let's see. Okay. So the dragon gave him his power and his seat in great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, uh, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto this beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given him a mouth, uh, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. This is another of those... Uh, this is another one of those references to three and a half years. Okay. And again, I'll have to, I'll have to um, do a video on that specifically on three and a half year periods. So um, this is reminiscent of what we just read in Daniel about a mouth speaking great things, right? Because the, the small horn in Matthew was given, uh, it had eyes and it had a mouth and it was speaking great things. Um, okay, so he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blasphemy his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And uh, th yeah, that seems to be true. That um, the great and abominable church and uh, a specific church has, has definitely had a lot of power, not just over... Uh, Italy, not just over Europe, but like throughout all the nations in one way or another. So uh, let's finish up by reading what it says in the um, student manual here. This is Revelation verses or chapter 13 verses 1 through 7. John saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Um, after seeing that Satan went to make war against the remnant of the seed of the woman, Joss saw a beast rise out of the sea. Uh, again, the woman referring to Revelation 12 in the church, right? So after Satan did that, John saw a beast rise out of the sea. Uh, the Joseph Smith translation, okay, this is something that 
evangelicals don't have or other Christian churches, the Joseph Smith translation indicates that the beast is in the likeness of the kingdoms of the earth. Uh, the beast, many heads, crowns, and horns suggest many different kingdoms and rulers with great power. The prophet Joseph Smith taught, quote, when God made use of the figure of a beast in visions to prophets, he did it to represent those kingdom wi kingdoms which had degenerated and become corrupt, savage, and beast-like in their dispositions, even the, the degenerate kingdoms of the wicked world. Rather than attempting to specify any exact identity of the beast, it may be more profitable to note the following general characteristics of the beast. It had power over many nations. It opposed God and blasphemy, blasphemed against him. Uh, the power it wielded was like the power uh, that predatory animals have over their prey. Uh, Satan gave it power. People of the world worshipped or followed the beast. And it was able to overpower many, including the saints. It can be said that any kingdom or government that exhibits these characteristics uh, manifests the spirit of the beast. Uh, Revelation 17, 8 through 12 contains additional information about the beast, uh, including its ultimate destruction. So, um, you know, a lot of times when you do watch these other um, Christian channels uh, that don't have our interpretation, one thing that they, they do have right, I guess like, I guess their concept of the great and abominable church, they don't have that concept really, but they have this idea of what's called uh, the beast system. Uh, which you could say is basically the same thing. So, um, so it, you know, we kind of have more information about that and more. Uh, I don't, know, I don't know how to explain it, but um, you know, you read about that in the Book of Mormon, um, and it, it's all, it's all kind of confusing if if you don't like get into it. But you know, you can see how they would think that there's going to be like a singular antichrist in the last days, but. Um, unless you have like the additional information from the Book of Mormon and also Joseph Smith's translation, and then you have this like modern revelation, you, you don't really understand that um, it's mostly uh, talking about uh, just the great and abominable church and and prop maybe even one church in particular. Um, but yeah, yeah. But there's many antichrists. So anyway, um, moving on. Revelation uh, thirteen seven war with the saints. John recorded that it was given to the beast from the sea to make war with the saints and overcome them. Uh, though the intended meaning of much of the symbolism in Revelation, Revelation 13 is uncertain, one message seems clear. Satan and those who uphold his work will be at war with the saints of God. Uh, Ezra, President Ezra Taft Benson taught, quote, Satan is waging war against the members of the church who have testimonies or are trying to keep the commandments. And while many of our members are remaining faithful and strong, some are wavering, some are failing, some are fulfilling John's prophecy that in the war with Satan, some saints would be overcome. And boy, oh boy, um, if he could just see our, I, maybe he did see our day, I don't know, but if Ezra Taft Benson could see what things are like right now, uh, it seems like just more and more I see people that are, I don't mean to be, um, depressing but i see more and more people that are falling away from the church they're they're giving into um basically what the world wants to see them do they they, they realize that they can't really uh stay in the church and still please the world and so they they choose the world and they go that way so this war with the saints is going on and this is an eternal war right it, it's a never-ending war um because you have people uh, through all generations of time, throughout all eternity, that are going to choose to um, choose evil over good. Uh, it, it's just, it's an eternal, it's an infinity war, isn't it? Right? <laughs> like the Avengers Infinity War. It never ends. It's always going to be like that. All right. So uh, I am just going to end it there. Uh, hopefully, this gives clarification. Um, just to summarize, yeah, I don't. I don't think that there is a singular, um, big bad uh, antichrist. Uh, I think that there are there are many antichrists. There were antichrists in the Book of Mormon. There were antichrists in the Bible, um, and in these last days, yes, we do have antichrists that have a lot of power. But I, I don't think that there's going to be 
one that's going to rise up that we're going to be like, oh, there he is. That's the Antichrist. We know that we're near. Uh, I, I don't think that that's the case. Although we can look at the great and abominable church, the church of the devil. We do know that that's been going on for a long time. And uh, and it seems to be getting even stronger and stronger and more fierce against the saints. And uh, by that, I think that we can say that the time is near. All right. So um, I'll leave it there. Make sure to share this with your social media and anyone that might benefit from learning about this. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it, hit the notification bell, leave your comments, and I'll talk to you guys later.